things were abdomen cutting. The Harry, oh, Harry, 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 Harry is yeah. a crude name, but there's a uh, septum or something like yeah. that. Well, this would be an industrial scale. Called magic. I think it's That's where they saw a person in magic. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this this is for real. <laughs> the more gory versions. Didn't get a no signal on HDMI one or PC in. That's one of the HDMI. Um, maybe tied to this. Oh, yeah, maybe. What did they do? Unplug it. Can you hear me? It was about a year I, ago that somebody I can hear you. HDMI on that. Can you hear me, Art? We're having okay. technical issues. I can hear you, yes. We're having technical issues over here. <laughs> oh, well, gee, that's exactly the place to have them. You know, the library. <laughs> so, can you see what port it's on? I'm trying to see. Well, the TV was set on, channel, on HDMI right. 3. So we will try that. Now maybe I need to go to display options. And... <laughs> it's the library and it's a short meeting. And of course it's going to have problems. Wi-Fi is down. We're on. We're on a cell phone. I'm only seeing one monitor. Actually, I'm seeing two monitors, but they're both my monitor. Are you? Are That's, your input buttons over there? No, but that's good. Okay, you're on HDMI three now. Am I? Mm -hmm. I'm okay. According to this, yeah, you know, when HDMI came over to the computer, yeah, because you got one plugged into the table. I I unplugged that. And apparently, it provides five volts and 900 milliamps. But where have we told the TV that we're, we're on? We're in, on HDMI 3. I'll pass it up. I mean, I don't know that that other cable isn't still connected. We're just going to see Okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's turn that off. Let's apply this. And I still don't see a picture. Ah, There's a picture. Know. This is off. Okay. It's, and it's a scary picture. <laughs> it's all on one screen now. But... Halloween. Hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> You're 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 on the big screen, sorta. I'm on the big screen. It's it's sort of works. It's, it's um. Uh, I think it made I think it made my monitor or made it as one extended monitor instead of two. But I think we actually are more successful when we do the whole thing virtually. <laughs> Well, when we're when we're virtual, we uh, yeah. <laughs> well, this is the first time I've not been able to connect to the wireless here. Well, we've had issues, uh, but it's been years ago mm -hmm. that we had issues with the wireless. She, the the librarian that came back with me, she gave me a different password to try. Yeah, but. My phone didn't connect to it either. So for the MPL private? No. It was for Franklin something. 
Um, my phone connected to it for about two seconds and then it disconnected and said, so I, in trouble. I, I have a feeling that they've got a hotspot up front turned on and too many people have connected to it. Yeah. <laughs> I had tr trouble connecting to Cincinnati Public Library at one point. This was years ago. Windows would connect, Linux wouldn't. And I talked to them and they said, oh, well, you'll have to call the central library. Somebody, yeah. Oh, okay. So I got some information before I left and I called and there was some guy that knew a lot about Linux. And when he found out that the setting for the library was 10.20.30.0 is the IP address for the router, it's like, well, that's not right. Hmm. Like, right. You're right. And, and <laughs> Linux just wouldn't yeah. accept that as the router IP address. They changed it to one and everything is fine after that. Well, this is the first time we've had Wi-Fi issues in mm -hmm. forever. But apparently they're aware of it because they had a backup that's not working well either. So. Our phone says internet, internet not available. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll either get a... Um, it'll connect for a couple of seconds and then it'll just disappear again or... Mostly what mine was doing was it was saying weak signal, good signal, weak signal, good signal, weak signal, good signal. Oh. Was there a big crowd there at the library today? Uh, it's about average, really. It's when, when, when we pulled in, Patty said, oh, it looks like there's more people here than, than there was last week, but that doesn't really mean much. It may be just my ears, but I'm having trouble hearing you, Art. You're having trouble hearing me? I yes. Are you having then then you're having trouble hearing me out of the speakers? Or the TV. Or well, I don't think because I think that's what's gets your audio routed through. I don't, I don't think. think. There you go. Try again. Say something. Or say something, Art. Oh, something. See, I think it's coming out of here. <laughs> I think it's coming out of here. So let's. Well, I've turned it up here, but it gets to the point where my earphones are bouncing uh, <laughs> and you guys can't, so can't hear me. Okay. Let's try that. Let's try that. Nope, can't hear you at all. Well, really? Uh, it, it was fault. it was it was me. It was me. I I, I changed the default output to something else. No, I it's can't. it's these it's these little tiny speakers that are in here. No, I didn't know whether it was those or tiny little brain cells over here. It's for now the old laptop. The the old laptop would default to the TV and it was nice and beautiful. This one, nope. And no matter what I have done to try to make it go to the TV, it does stupid crap like that. Either it'll mute everything or it just doesn't work. So hmm. generally these are pretty loud. So people don't really have problems hearing it. And this has a nice bass system to it. If I'm playing music, but well, so you may recall three, four weeks ago, I sent you guys a little video of the monitors and mm -hmm. who were circulating around. And now the screen's not doing that, but the audio is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how or where, but the audio is going. It, it, from channel to channel to it's channel. rotating around. Gotta love it. I am. It's awesome. I am on high power. Can you hear me now? It's yes. it's not it's not you, Art. 
it's it's a setup over here. He he just needs to move closer so he could hear you. Huh? <laughs> so uh, this is this is a short meeting. Apparently we have people coming in at 6 30. You got toys to show or is that something else? Me, Robin, Steve. Steve's a great resource for I like stuff. Yeah. I could bribe him. I could I could be bragged by him all day long. Just you really you, you really can't see the it. detail on that, but that is a 16 minute Minchie. 16 minute? 16 minute. And 15, it's, not, it's not perfect. It's not great. It's it's good, but it's not for 16 minutes. It's great. It's not great. And it's on the floor. And land the right side up. <laughs> Oh, it's still afloat. It's still floating. <laughs> there's, there's definitely. Um, once you, no, said hi. No. <laughs> once you hold it and look at it, you'll you'll see just how bad it, it actually is. It looks like it's lying across. Or is that a temperature issue? Um, maybe. <laughs> It might be a speed issue. It might be that that blue filament. It doesn't really like the blue filament. Yeah. So that's a difference in positioning at different layers. And when it happens, you had that going hundred percent speed, didn't you? It was faster than that. Really. It the the regular benchy mm -hmm. is forty minutes and some change in in seconds. This was sixteen minutes flat, so it was faster. It was more than more than half faster than, than the than the normal benchy, and the normal benchy wasn't perfect either at forty minutes. But that's not bad for sixteen. The roof has shingles. Yeah. It, I, it, like I said, when you hold it and you actually look at it up mm -hmm. close, you can see all the little imperfections. I think I think printing it that fast would give you a decent idea for maybe fit or something if you were trying to match parts together or something. If you're doing a five-pointed star or a six-pointed star, you can tell the difference. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think it would give you an idea about sizes and then... Oh, yeah, like a rough prototype or... Yeah, a rough prototype. Um, but, I mean, look, the, the front of it's even... Yeah. That particular standpoint, though, if you're going to coat it with something and polish it out... It's it's not horrible. It'd be fine. It's not horrible, but it's not, it it's not right. Standard <laughs> for a few seconds and then filling in with the... Blaze or whatever that you. But if you're using a piece of equipment beyond its design limits, you have to expect it. Well, this this new printer, I was impressed at the limits. I mean, it that's fast. This. It's good. This was this was one of their test files. It was on the on the thing, and I said, "Yeah, whatever. Okay, let's see," and it. It, it said 11 minutes, but it, it took 16 to actually print. Process. Which printer is this? The Cobra 3, any cubic Cobra 3. And uh, I just bought some more filament because I've played enough that I've run out of filament. And I'm going to try the four color option tonight. It it will do four colors up to four. It'll do up to eight, but I've only got the four color option right now. And uh, I was looking at the manual again just to make sure that I was connecting it all up. It says that it doesn't care which 
nozzle you plug it into beyond it on the on the ace unit the, the four color unit mm -hmm. it's got one two three four but the manual says it doesn't matter what where you plug it into at on the printer and i'm like okay <laughs> i'm not real sure how that works but oh well you okay. have to define what color goes where and it's probably first second third fourth color is in nozzle one two three four if you then say just use nozzle three or color three, it should work. I I think there's something to that 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 because it looks like you can define you can actually click on the material and mm -hmm. tell it this is blue and this is red. Mm -hmm. Um of course I haven't tried it yet. So tonight's tonight's tonight to play and see if I can get four color to work. So I'm I'm kind of looking forward to that. Now between colors, does it uh, purge a section? Yeah. Um there's there's a video. Uh, uh there there was a uh, before I bought this I, I watched a couple of videos and there's a really good review bit video. And she, the, the lady doing it kind of talks about some of the issues with doing some of the high speed stuff. Um, but it weighed out, you know, she's got one of the bamboo four color units. I, and, now I watched her video with bamboo. And she's got, she's got the Unicubic um, and she talks about the differences between the two and, and whatever, but it's comparable, apparently, to the waste that the bamboo does because it also it purges, and then it has to build a little wall, a wiping wall, so that you don't get those weird little strings or whatever. So, and I mean, my old my old printer that had two nozzles, you know, two actual print heads. Um. That's pretty much how it worked. I mean, you even even it would retract from one to, to switch to the other nozzle and, and print, but it had to go over and wipe wipe the nozzle off because well, you're not talking about thirty feet of filament being wasted. No, you're talking some. <laughs> it 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 depending upon the size of the print, it could get significant. But well, if you're switching. Colors very often, yeah. Um, and so frequently you, you are. Yeah, the, the 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 kid wants something, and I have a feeling it's going to switch colors. Way more than I want, <laughs> way more than I wanted to, but she bought the filament, so I don't care. <laughs> I watched a video not too long ago where a guy was 3D printing a full size hydrofoil. Cool. For an individual hydrofoil scooter. And he had initially wanted the infill to be sealed so that it would have positive. 100%? Sealed so it would be float. Uh, oh, okay. okay. Floating. <laughs> there was enough of a leak between the layers that all he succeeded in doing was filling the entire hydrofoil with water that he couldn't get out. Yep. But did did you send me the video of the person that made the full size Benchy? No. Uh -uh. Okay. Somebody uh -huh. somebody did. Well, the guy I knew was the one in uh, England, uh, New Castle, New Manchester, something like that. Okay. The uh, there's there's a video where somebody it it's a couple of hundred different prints and they stuck them all together and made a full size benchy that would actually float and 
they could get in it and, and <laughs> they had a little uh, outboard motor so they were driving it around. I'm like, I'm crazy, but I don't think I'm that crazy. You lived in a tube under the sea. Yeah, but and I and I would have uh my my craziness comes from printing all the parts and gluing them all together. Now that's crazy. <laughs> if I had a huge printer, I would print me a full I upscale. I should have brought I should have brought one because it they were they're gorgeous. I upscaled this to 200 percent They're huge. And I printed it, and they're gorgeous. They're beautiful boats. That you can see the guy that knows where you are. What's that car? Lamborghini. Mm -hmm. uh, the first car was Lamborghini. The, the second car he's done, he did a, with TL or Paul ASA. Yeah. On a on a creative pen or something. Um, crap. It's a lot more expensive than all the um <laughs> the McLaren. Well, yeah, the McLaren. Yeah, back here or something. It, yeah. it was in a wreck. All he, he bought the the frame. Okay. And, and, and the the seating area, and then built the rest of it out of three D printed parts from ASA, and redid the whole body. Is that the same guy? <laughs> One of those two car companies is sued him because he made I his it. own. There's nothing they could really say. <laughs> he bought from a junkyard. And... Yeah, the McLaren probably was fine. It, it, it might have been the Lamborghini that, that didn't like it because he. Well, I know. It's certainly an issue if you sell it. If yeah. it's for your own use, I don't think they've got any right to say anything. I, to say, I know that the guy that did the Porsche. Put his prints for free on his web page. Uh -huh. That might maybe, maybe that was it. Maybe that was the one that I heard. One of the one of those guys who did the three D made a three D printed car. Yeah, there was a got early, got sued. There was an early guy that did a Porsche with his son. And we can't print a car. He's like, "What a bet!" <laughs> I think I can. <laughs> Well, I can see how Porsche might object if he has a giant Porsche logo. Let's see. I I I would almost argue that it's the same thing as like those kit cars were with the VW bugs. Yeah. You buy a VW bug, you pull the shell off, and you put a different shell on. But there was licensing with those going back to the original manufacturers. Yeah, probably the Laser Nine Seventeen or the. the Porsche was making six hundred dollars on each one of those kits that got sold. Yeah, and those didn't say Porsche on them anyway. No, but you're they right. Were, they uh, they look just look like it. Yeah, Porsche. Yes, Porsche. Front of your house. <laughs> it's it's a Wolfenrad porch. <laughs> if you're making your own design print, and just I don't see where they have any grounds to be designed it from scratch. There's yeah. nothing, you're not going to be exact. Replica, and I mean, even if you're close, you made it so from scratch. It'd be hard to press, but now you're going to put it out there and make it publicly available. We'll try to profit off something that's cloning. Plus, minus in the print. It's probably kind of hard to see, but I, I printed some custom keycaps. Oh. And I had some issues. And I actually ended up printing these in PLA instead of SLA. Uh, really? Yeah. Um, it's easier to see it on the, if you rotate it like that, 15 degrees. There you go. There you go. So you're getting an oblique lighting. Yeah. So well, that print, shows pretty good. Print screen, uh, maximize and minimize. Volume control. No. Yeah, and well, I'm using this as a scroll wheel, scroll oh, wheel right now. 
Um, and then this one, where's my camera? Where's the camera? So this was the one that I wanted to use for, for uh, at home Zoom meetings. So I could turn the video off, mute myself or mute everybody. So that's that's a speaker with a slash to it, and that's just a microphone and a camera. Okay. So it can remind me of what what these keys are set up for. So what's in there? And then and then that one copy paste and uh, cut hmm. in the wrong order, but that's the way I use them. So I don't use it. I don't. I don't. Sorry, I copy and paste. I don't. Like you USB. Your layers on this are extremely fine. They look like a, a thick piece of paper. Yeah. So that I I printed those on the Flash Forge, um, which is my older printer. I slowed it way the hell down. Um. Like way, um, and it's already a slow printer. And Looks good. Very pretty. I I'm a so, so baby's box. The the keypads were six bucks from AliExpress. It's amazing what you can get from AliExpress. Yeah, and I and I was I was kind of impressed with them, so I bought. Two more. It, it's kind. Of, they're actually kind of really cool. Um, but the the problem was is now that I, I had three, I couldn't remember what was on each one, so I printed custom keys for them. And, uh, I I think it turned out okay. I probably need to coat the keys so, so that my oils don't. If you do the UV cures clear stuff, yeah, you can put a nice little domed top on them. They're not bad though. Yeah, yeah, those are better than what I think. <clears throat> well, I mean, it was I I, I printed them with with the um, resin printer first, mm -hmm. and just they were brittle and they they just didn't work right. Yeah. I could not get them to, to seat on the, the the couple of them that I actually got onto the key itself mm -hmm. actually broke. And that was huh. how they I, I pushed them on there. But you know, the the little hole that yeah. the plus thing, one side of it broke. That's why it went onto the key. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, I don't like this. I didn't like the feel of them. I, I didn't think they felt right. So I said, well, what the hell? I'll try it on, on the, the flash for the processor on some weird yeah. some uh -huh. weird thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Now one of those, the key isn't all the way down. It's that one. Yes. That key, I have printed that three times now. That was the best one I could get. And looking at it from underneath, it appears that it's, it's bent. Not centered. It's bent. Yes, you're you're absolutely right. That that key came from a different set of key caps, and I don't think whoever designed it designed it very well. Um, you ever use Open SCAD? Yeah, there are lots of ECAP libraries for practically anything. Practically anything, though. I, that that key that's sticking up a little mm -hmm. that that he noticed. That key, I broke the center pin out of. Mm -hmm. You know the the crosshair thing. Yeah. I broke that out of twice. Let's see. One of them I could not get it. That basically was the best one I could get, and it's not right. The other keys hmm. are fine. So, yeah. I, what I, side was down on those? One of the the diagonals? No, I ended up printing these 
flat, just like just like when they're sitting, just like they're sitting. Um, now I ended up printing them like that. I put a brim around them to try to hold them in, in mm -hmm. place a little bit better. Um, a lot of these I put uh, stands in. Um, what are they? All those things. Like tunnelons. Yeah. Supports. Supports. I try, I, I put supports in, and as it turns out, I didn't need to do that because the, the center thing actually gives it plenty of support. But, but I did, I didn't really know that at the time. Sure. Everything I've seen has you printing them like that with supports for the center post. Yeah. Well, the, 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 the thing that I found told me to print them at 45 degrees and that didn't quite work right either. So. Do you want some brown switches? Don't like the reds. The, I don't. I, I don't I, either. I but. picked up a set of um, Oh, shoot. Pale something speed pro browns at Micro Center going, man, all the kales I've gotten so far are pretty decent. These are the mushiest browns <laughs> ever. It's like these are just reds with the long color. Yeah, they're, they're, they're red. They're red. It's red, you know, for six bucks. Oh, yeah. I, you yeah. can't you can't really complain too much and they do exactly what they're supposed to do looking at the uh, little specks the difference in color that are from the filament or is that no that's so three months ago four months ago something like that i let the grandkid pick out color at uh, micro speckle i told her i wanted gray and she said okay and she she found gray it says um what what, what was it something something gray marble so it's marble marble effect i guess but i would not call that gray exactly <laughs> she found what the box said gray she gave me what I asked for <laughs> well, looking at the bottom of the little cylinder or column in there um, it looks like the recess was supposed to be plus shaped with is kind of distorted too. Is that from pushing the piss out of it to get it on? Um, that is that is probably one of them that I used um, the the stands with, and I didn't really have a clue how how to do it. So when I was removing the stands, it probably pulled part of that off. Um, there was. A couple of these, when I put the brim, I didn't tell it to just put a brim. I told it to put a complete brim, a, a, a full, like a, a like a raft kind of deal. So the raft covered that hole, so I had to clean that hole out. Um, so, no, these aren't perfect, but no, no, but I, the, and the, I'm not being critical. I'm just being inquisitive. No, I I understand, but. This is that that is the part that you're not going to see, so it doesn't move. It doesn't yeah, work. Aesthetically, it's not, always, it's not a problem. But I, I didn't know whether mechanically it would interfere with fitting. I I don't think that it's a problem because that key goes on like that, where that key still takes some pushing. Um, that that key, this key is going to break eventually because it's off center and it's not, it's just not right, and I don't like it. But it is what it is. <laughs> the other keys, 
if you if you look you can see how far down the other keys go and that key is a good and it's <laughs> it's actually the key cap not the it's, it's the key cap the switch so, okay those switch okay 60 cents a piece if you buy them yeah <laughs> dream key reds the, these things yeah i i i was trying to figure out what they were i've never heard of dream keys 45 so, gram so beds. so you figure if they're making these things in bulk they are not paying anywhere close to 60. so it's, it's okay, they're, probably not even paying <laughs> they're probably making the switches and going oh these are the offshoots we don't like these put them on this thing <laughs> the price to order this for an iphone uh, the parts like the, what it costs fox Prime to make an iphone under 60. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 15 bucks. Really? Oh, wow. So I wonder what this piece of crap costs. Oh, I would probably six. They, yeah. they're, they're selling this key thing for six bucks. You can yeah. find them for, for, for less. Less. If you really look hard for that. It's a laser cutted piece of plastic there's a pcb board in there and three cheap ass red switches black keycaps and an encoder mm -hmm. this thing has to cost like 50 cents tops to make if you go to lowe's and you buy a package of four screws it's going to be 350. yeah but the they're the ones making the screws. <laughs> they're the ones selling the screws for three fifty. <laughs> no, they're selling them to some dude for two thousand for a buck. And then there's a guy that hauls them across the ocean for fifty dollars. And then there's a guy over here that bags them for four four per pack. And then he's the one charging oh. three fifty. <laughs> Yeah, but, but the Chinese people that, that make this little thing are making the screws. Look, the screws are probably the most expensive thing. There's four freaking screws in that. I made something pretty once. It was a 3D print. And the screws cost more than everything else combined. They were nice brass wood screws. I I would I would hazard a guess that the encoder probably is the most expensive is part. probably the most expensive. It's got a nice feel. Yeah. It's nice. loose enough to be easy to turn. I get a yet yet it's loose enough to be nice to turn and tight enough not to just turn. Yeah. I didn't. The, the switches are the the the, the yeah, weakest part. The, the switches are the weakest part. See, I I want the push button on these to be weaker. better. Oh. Weaker, yeah, yeah. That's too. I don't know. I I kind of like it, but I don't use the push button. Yeah, for anything. So, well, what I was thinking. So I need one with four buttons, and a, a rotary encoder. I want the rotary encoder to change the color of the backlights: red, blue, green, yellow. So now I have sixteen keys. Turn it till it's red. And the keys do something, right? So it's yellow, so, they do something else. So they do make a bigger, mm -hmm. well, they make oh, several seen, bigger models of these. Four, six, eight, twelve, and a 13. Most, most of the, especially the bigger ones, have mm -hmm. an extra button in the back. Oh, okay. And a, sw a slider switch. Yeah. I'm not real sure what the slider switch does, but... From what I've read, because there's no instructions. Yeah. They, 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 here you go, figure it out. Yeah. The oh. button, oh, website the, yeah. the, the yeah. button is the key that it's programmed for three layers, mm -hmm. and the button will switch the layers. Mm -hmm. So um, it's basically the same processor that, that this one uses. Yeah. But 
it's got some ex a, a couple of extra features that this one doesn't have. Um, I saw one. I'm not sure what processor it's using, but I saw one that actually has a little screen on it for twenty two dollars. It's got hmm, eight keys, I think. It's a good number. And Let me do most of what I want. Uh, I think it's got two rotary encoders on it and the little screen, and I'm like, yeah. Okay, but the software that that I've got doesn't support the screen. I don't. I. Yeah, I don't trust anything that use their software. Right. I just don't. So, which that's one of the reasons I'm looking at doing making practically your own. everything with an RP twenty forty. Yeah. The uh, well, when I saw just what this was and how simple it was, I was mm -hmm. like, C3 could do this. Mm -hmm. Or an S3, a, a cheap S3 could do it because the S3 supports, you know, Bluetooth. Uh, oh, yeah. Bluetooth uh, HID. And now you got to put in battery. I'm okay with large. Well, even, even if you weren't with an S3, you could get it to do a whole bunch more stuff, still plug it in. Yeah. Might be handy to have it through too. But I I would I found I didn't I didn't realize that these didn't come programmed mm -hmm. because they don't. They don't come programmed. I found somebody on GitHub who figured it out yeah. more or less still says that there's some issues with, with some stuff but he supports it supports 99% of these really cheap ones mm -hmm. and um, he had one of the one of the big issues is can't reprogram the LEDs. They they're baked in. They they do what they do, and that's what they okay. do. As long um, as they're not sitting there breathing all the time, I'd be okay. If I've got they do. I just don't solve. It. I've got mine going. No, you can you can turn them off. Oh, okay. Um, with his software, you can turn them off. But there's like four different patterns. patterns that it does. And none of them are good, yeah. but I've got mine going just just kind of a sweep yeah. across it. It would be nice if, if it would do something like different colors or you can program it to do something. But if the he he if the processor is listed for QMK, you can make it do anything you want. It, I had to set up a UDIV uh, thing for it so that I didn't have to keep typing sudo to, to use the software mm -hmm. um, and and some other stuff. It it's a strange it's a strange processor. I think it's actually probably might be one that they're using for the serial connection and some of the really cheap stuff. Oh, well, that 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 little uh that stupid little uh processor that they use for the serial connection mm -hmm. it's got gpio on it it's just nobody ever uses it yeah it's a serial pass through <laughs> but um anyway if if you picked up some of these I, i'll send you the link to the to the github it's His, his apparently a lot of people in the GitHub uh, issue thing are are saying, yeah, you know, it's better than than the Windows software because the Windows software is generic for everything. Mm -hmm. His is more specific for. I've got three three buttons, so I use the three button thing instead of now. Apparently, according to him, 
I'm not really supposed to be able to program it the way I programmed it, but it works. Um, you know, one of these has uses like three different alt key combinations for mm -hmm. for something, and he says that it, it that won't work on the three three switch version. And mm. I said, "Well, what the heck? It, might as well try it, right?" And it works its fine. So. So either he hasn't updated his thing recently or or he doesn't have that keypad. This is a different keypad or something. But he he, he does say that there are some known issues with the three book three button uh thing that apparently some of the LED patterns don't work or something. And, it's not like it's not like I really care yeah, that the LEDs so. were. It'd be neat to have some of it, but it's it is what it is, and it was six bucks. Well, I I have a question for you guys. Um, my stepson works for Staples, and the Staples. Um, or in Middletown are being shut down. Yeah, lots of them are. And he got me an Asus 17.3 inch um, laptop for $200. Can you? Can you get more? <laughs> no. That was the only one left yeah. on the shelf. It wasn't on their inventory, but it was on the shelf. <laughs> but the question I have is it has a very large uh, touchpad. The last touchpad I have is from a laptop that's like 20 years old. And I can tolerate that and lose it. But the uh, touchpad on this Asus no matter how I adjust it, um, when the capacitance of what, I can't use it. I end up having the cursor move around mm -hmm. when I'm trying to insert it in the wrong place. And yeah, I'm I'm trying to reach over and tap a left mouse button. Function F three, I think, toggles it on and off. Toggles the touchpad on and off. Yep. Um, it's I, one of the F keys. And yeah, it's, it's it's F three on this one. Okay, but my question was more along the lines: of if anybody got any experience with an Asus laptop, and do they have similar problems with the touchpad? Oh, everything that has a touchpad does that. Um, yep, yeah, that's pretty much the answer. Yeah, function <laughs> F three. It's pretty common. In so, Linux, you can you can set it. Turns off automatically and doesn't turn on until you click it. And that's kind of handy if it physically clicks. If it doesn't... No, it's, it is it's, okay. as responsive as this tabletop. Yeah, because even this crappy crap top I've got, it... I mean, I, I do a double tap and it sees that as a double tap. But it also has buttons on it. Um, when when Dad got his new laptop, he hated the touchpad. He just ended up plugging the mouse and plugging the mouse in and turning the turning the stupid touchpad off. Well, I appreciate that because <laughs> like that's real estate that is worthless to me. Oh. No, I don't have that. Are you uh, sure? You might want to try it. The the touchpad is about. Uh, uh, oh yeah, it's two business cards. Yeah, it, it's it's as big as, as what I've outlined with my fingers. Mm -hmm. And they've got one touch, one finger, two fingers, three fingers, and four finger gestures mm -hmm. that are in there. And four. Oh, I haven't seen those yet. Nice. I'm, um, I'm not <laughs> impressed with any of them because none of them work for me. Yeah. 
you know, I, I've gone from turning the sensitivity as far down as I can, in which case, got it, yep. read on it, and it still moves the cursor around. It, it's, okay, so yeah. you've answered my question. It, yeah. It's, it's yeah. the ASUS touchpad. It's touchpads. The best cursor control I had on any laptop I've ever owned was on an Everex 386 that I think had a plasma display and had this little drawer on the bottom yeah. in and out and had a little tiny scroll wheel, a little thumb wheel. It was great. It was right under your thumb there, while you were typing. There was there was a laptop that had a little drawer, yeah. but the touchpad was in the drawer. You, oh, I never saw that. That that was cool. Because because it it solved you can close it. it it solved that problem. If you wanted to type, you well, close the the IBM student touchpad. Pad that had a little uh, in the middle of a keyboard had a little nipple. A nipple. Yeah. I love that. Oh really? So most people didn't. They didn't. They never got to where pushing for two seconds got it to this corner. They wanted to be able to just drag it. And they tried to, and then they fall off and start typing on accident. It, yeah, the, they did that. IBM, whatever. Uh, it, the 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 little nipple thing was a bit hit or miss. Yeah, you you'd find people that really liked it, and then you find other people. Can you get that off of my? <laughs> I don't want that on my keyboard. Well, every time, right? Every time I type an H, it moves. I like it. Everything with my fingers, I. Oh, that's why I liked Lotus One Two Three. I could go slash R say whatever, and I never had to take my fingers away from the keyboard to reach over and get them out. Or in this instance with the Asus, is take my fingers away from the keypad so, and, and operate that. So the best, the best thing I can say, it just like. I did with my dad. Yeah, yeah, you you yeah. don't like the touchpad. You'll never get used to the stupid thing. Let's just go and get you a mouse. <laughs> we'll turn off the touchpad and you'll never, ever have to think about it ever again. <laughs> I, I took the mouse off of my machine in the basement and plugged in the, the dongle and use that as like, oh, yeah, this, is, this is what I want. Yeah. He would like the way I yep. got one of my keyboards that each on layer three HJKML or mouse movement keys. UI and O are one, two, and three for the mouse buttons. Works pretty well. And how do you toggle to that? Or do you... um, the pause key and then what's next to it? Print screen? Print screen. Pause print screen toggles that on and off. Okay, so essentially now either uh, keypad, mm -hmm. letter keypad, yep. or the mouse keypad. Yep. Yeah. And it also has all of my logins and passwords <laughs> and almost it has everything except for the password for my keypads that I put on the oh. keyboard. But if somebody logs in on my work account, but yeah, I, you can do some neat stuff with a program over a keyboard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I did two things that I need to work on. I want to make a fan controller, so I found the ICs I want to use, and I ordered them from DigiKey. They're six millimeters square, 16 pin ICs. There is no way in hell I can solder these things. Can anybody solder these onto a breadboard for me? <laughs> My soldering skills have just plummeted in the last five years. I used to be able to solder anything. I've already destroyed one of the chips and I only have three spares. How, how big are they? They're quad thin pack or something uh, like that. They're, the chips are six millimeters square. The pads don't extend past yeah. the edge and it has 16 pads total. So, so you probably five. need a uh, 
a heat gun. Heat gun, yeah. Yeah. And some of that uh liquid solder. I've got some somewhere. Yeah, what is that stuff? It's not called liquid solder. It, it, that's the stuff. Yeah. yeah. You drop it on there and you flux it up really good and you yeah. with a little with a little squeeze uh mm -hmm. plunger thing and go psh, and you go with your with your heat gun and you go melt. Okay, done. Yeah. I've seen it done, but I've never done that. I I've got a heat gun. I actually bought one specifically for doing re reflow work and that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And never ever bought the the flux or the solder paste or any or any of that stuff. So I've got the solder paste. I don't know if I've got the half gallon of flux everybody seems to be using, <laughs> but I would prefer to do it on a hot plate. Yeah. But while I think that I have all the pins in the right order and I know what I want and can get the circuit board printed, <laughs> I know my luck. I'm going to have three pins swapped. So they don't they don't make a dip. Oh, version of, oh, no. of this? No, it's a microchip something or other. Uh, see, I hate I hate that they've yeah they basically have taken and said, okay, makers, you've got to figure out how to deal yes. deal with this SMA crap. Yeah. <laughs> well they don't you know, they don't worry about makers anymore. No, I know, but but they they used to I mean you used to be able to get it everything in two different packages you could at least test your design out with dips and then mm -hmm. say okay order a bunch of the surface mount crap so. yeah and and now surface mount well it's it's been like this for years but surface mount stuff comes in decent size that that's solderable down to teeny tiny that you're going Oh, yeah. I don't know if I can see that. <laughs> so I ordered some LEDs for one of my mice, and they were, the LEDs were bigger than these chips I just Yeah. Bought. And they only had four, <laughs> four leads on them. No, it's, it's, it's true. The, the, they, they're not expecting people to actually make stuff. They're expecting them to load these paper tape yeah, things up into a machine, and the machine puts it all where it belongs, and runs it over a solder a, a bath a, a solder bath. Yeah. Oh. And that's the thing. At this point, it's probably cheaper just to go ahead and have the Chinese make it for you. Yeah. <laughs> I I went ahead and ordered some stuff from jail PCB or whatever. Yeah, technically it was inexpensive, but really, no, it wasn't. I've, I've. Most of you were only buying a couple, right? I bought six copies of one board that was just download these files and upload them here. And so far, of the three I've tested so far, none of them are working. And now I'm angry and out of the bus. Years, years ago, I built my own Laura boards. Somebody had the PCB files. I got them and found out every component on there was surface mount. And I, ooh. But at the time, it was bigger. It was the bigger surface mount, yeah. so it was at least doable, sort of. It was at least obtainable to to get it done. And I didn't really know what I was doing. Yeah, <laughs> but that's why I bought. That's why I bought the the heat gun was because, well, if I've got to do this, <laughs> I built a one of those component testers. Um. And that was, it was a piece of cake. And that was surface mount stuff. Um, I'm trying to remember. It had a, a 
Arduino as the main yeah. chip. And I'm trying to think if that was surface mount. It, it probably was. Yeah. And I, I looked online and people were like, how do you solder this stuff? And like, really? That was simple. There was you start a, with the smallest part first. There was a uh, Kickstarter game system that basically was an Arduino, mm -hmm. Uno, and some others that miscellaneous components but one of the the really the only thing that was on there that was surface mount was the sd card okay yeah and i was looking you know good size. It, it was it, yeah it was definitely easy enough to to solder if you have even a inkling of how solder yeah. works but i kept looking on these forums and these people are like, I don't, it, I've I've done something, I don't think it's right, and it's not reading SD's cards. And I'm like, that was one of the simpler, the simpler surface mount things I've ever seen. Yeah. And the pins were spaced decently enough apart that. And, and you're talking SD, not micro SD. No, it was, it was micro. Okay. It was micro mm -hmm. SD. That's a little harder. But I think it was micro SD. But it, it 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 was still big enough that you could you could do it. It was all you needed to know was enough to know. <laughs> I have this feeling that that a bunch of people who've never ever soldered got it and went, I can't do that. I I, I barely did the other stuff. Oh, what's this? Dell branded micro SD cards. Awesome. Oh, those are coming out of servers at work <laughs> that have um it, so it says Dell. You can't see it, but it says Dell. Yeah, I've been around they, they have VMware ESXi on them. And so these Dell servers have two of these cards and two. TF cards set up as RAID. OS is installed on those. We got to get you a macro camera. I know. This camera, this camera in the thing does okay, but it needs light. I'm I'm kind of upset that I can't find smaller SD cards anymore. 16 gig is plenty for 99% of what I do. And it's getting to the point where what you can buy is 64 gigs or above. There. Mm. It almost showed up. Yep. Well, you can tell it's a 16. I'm yeah. trying to shine a my camera flashlight on it, and it's not really helping. Do you want one of those little USB microscope cameras? I have one. Because, I mean, the smaller stuff gets, the more useful that becomes. One of the reasons I like this pen. I, I, I think I have one. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what I have. On that, does anybody need a, a cooler for a, a NVMe drive? Hmm. I have a pair of them that I don't need. I think so. You just your NVMe drive in that. Yeah. Oh, a, a bonus. Uh, yeah. So you just put it in. Yeah. Slide. Well, you in. don't slide it. You take out the screws, put it in, and then squish it down on there. It's a that's a real conformal heat sink on there. I apologize that the heat sink's already on it. Um, these things are like five dollars a piece, but they're they're really nice. And I so years ago, yeah, I'll, I'll open my machine back up and well, it won't work in a laptop usually, but, but most other things it will. Yeah, I think there's plenty of room in in that all in one. That's where that's, that's where that. Here. Alcohol wipes or something. I don't know. <laughs> you need, I don't know, you got the screw. 
years and years and years ago, I built a bunch of servers for a printing company I worked at, and half of them had these cast aluminum heat sinks that the drives were mounted in. And they had like two tablespoons of heat sink compound thrown in there too. But that part was awful. But they all had the exact same drives. And those drives started failing at four years. The drives that had those heat sinks on them, all, every single one of them, I'm talking about 80 drives, lasted seven or eight years. <laughs> And at that point of the the other drives without the heat sinks, they were at maybe 20% left. The first drive I lost with the heat sink was seven and a half years, I think. And at that point, I had lost 45 of the non-heat sink drives. So yeah, getting heat away from electronics helps. I I I like heat sinks. I had one of the auctions that, that I went to down in Kentucky that was selling computer junk. He had a bunch of old, old, old tough book things, but they weren't I don't remember who who made them. They weren't Panasonics, they weren't any name I had ever heard of, ever. I bought the whole entire palette for 20 bucks, I think. And there were 400 of these things on there. We took some, we ran them over, we threw them out four-story windows just to see what they would do. I opened up one of those, and not only was the hard drive encased in a silicon gel, but it had a heat sink on it. And I was like, Oh, damn! Yeah. <laughs> they they really do not want this thing to work. <laughs> and the worst I ever was able to do with one, we had opened the, the shell up, and then we drove over it, and that was the only time only time we got it to actually break the screen. But the computer came on. If you plugged it into a monitor, it was just fine and happy and dandy. And most toughest, tough things I've ever seen in my life. They were huge. They were tiny little. The monitor probably was 13 inch screen. Little things. Old school. Those things were tough. Uh, for Freightliner for diagnosis in the that, semis or whatever. That may have been where they came from. I don't know where they came from. There was nothing on the hard drives. The hard drives were, I mean, these things were old, but when I bought them, the hard drives were. If those were 4,200 RPM hard drives. Yeah. Just 80 intentionally gig. slow. 80 gig, maybe. Yes. 80 gig. Yeah, on old tough books. Yeah, old, say, old. Uh, 80. It was probably Wi Fi A, too. Mm -hmm. 80 something. That, they were... that was the thing that those mechanics were bitching about the most because it took forever to pull up a print. Yeah. I was like, well, you know, it was like, this was when Wi Fi was brand spanking new. <laughs> yeah, I, I oh, had I, a tough book that the, had a a copper heat sink on the hard drive. Yeah. And then phosphor bronze springs to mount again. Yeah. It was cool. <laughs> this wasn't this wasn't a name brand that I had ever recognized. Uh, okay. it, it wasn't a tough book, but it was a tough. generic tough book. It was a tough book. Ish. It it was, it was tough like a company in the armor. It, it actually probably was because I had seen plenty of police tough books mm -hmm. at that point that had actually been destroyed by various and sundry things. And this, this, like I said, we threw them out of five-story windows. We just went, let's see. We didn't pay anything for these things. We paid $20 for the entire pallet. Let's see what happens. <laughs> we, uh, I, I mean... 
when you when you got nothing in them, you might as well see if you can destroy them, right? <laughs> they, well, then you find out you could have sold them for five hundred bucks a pop, and you're like, oh damn. <laughs> yeah. uh, we we put them on eBay. Uh, I think we grouped them up in lots of five at a time or something. I think we got. 75 bucks a piece or 75 bucks a lot a set. a set that's not bad it it was and, and then you know basically we said you got to load there's no hard drive there was a hard drive but there was no no no, uh, no OS and no uh, USB no CD ROM no nothing you got to figure out how to put an OS on this site. No, no USB Things were antique. Yeah. They were yeah. antique. They were like two thousand or so. They were antique. Probably when they were using them in service, they probably were <laughs> antique. <laughs> when you you mentioned eBay and it triggered something, I'm looking for a two and a half horsepower, thirty four fifty RPM single phase one ten or one twenty. Motor for general duty, not compressor, not pump duty. Anybody got one of those laying around? Two horse? That's a pretty good size. Yeah. Two or two and a half. Oh. No. I, I figured I'd ask. Um, I, I can't I, say. Unfortunately, that. I think they're almost all 1720 RPM, but blower motors for furnaces are often available and yeah. that's about the size we're, we're looking for and, and i have a uh, quarter horsepower blower motors that enter uh, 750. i'm looking for a replacement for my one horsepower table saw oh so I, I i need is it one of the job saws where it hangs off the back yeah mm -hmm. oh i may have one of those off of a craftsman table saw well, and it's I it's dual now, shaft, but, it, but it's just uh, one horsepower. I'm looking to the up at the this one's two. I gave the table saw to somebody, but I know for a fact that he's never turned it on. And I'll ask him if he wants to get rid of it. But it's a it's an old craftsman cast iron top table saw. Okay, it's a pretty decent saw. Actually. Well, I I'm happy with the saw. I, I'm just wanting to to get a little bit more oof out of the. Uh, motor. Motor. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Re remember, this is the the man who had a, you know, twenty foot long rotary tool. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit more oomph. <laughs> now, not everybody has seen that video. <laughs> everybody in this room, right? I I, I think everybody here has. <laughs> I even shared that with the guys at work. Yeah. That was awesome. Art, what we're talking about is a I made a uh, lathe that fit on an aluminum ladder and was driving uh, a, uh, a spindle so I could cut it down out of uh, glued up two before's using a skill saw as live tooling. So, Very we'll, brave. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to find the video. I, I thought you had seen it, Art. So what were you making? I don't recall. We'll have to we'll have to dig it up. I'll have to I'll have to uh share the video again. <laughs> Michael's Crazy lathe on YouTube. Okay. There's a lot of positive feedback on that channel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They like the chair. One of the guys did. Yeah, oh, the, the benches. The benches. Yeah. The, yeah. That was that's one of the craziest things I've. <laughs> it's the first video that comes up if you Google it. I can't imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> there haven't been any any new comments for four or five years, but 
one of them is this woman says, I can't believe he's there breathing out like that. <laughs> so, it's only a little sawdust, is it? Well, it's, it's a coming off of it in a column. And mm -hmm. I'm I'm not in that column. You look, the video is taken through the column, so it looks like I'm in the middle of this giant shower. My mechanic friend or whatever he is, the, was, when I was talking to him the other day, he was saying how uh, he, he was in his 20s or whatever, and he went to advanced welding class, and you know, he said he was the youngest guy there by like 30 years, you know? And it was all, they were telling me like, but instructing it all on these advanced helmet sets and stuff and what kind of metals you can weld with them and this and that and then the teacher goes he's like Who, here's welded with aluminum or, or galvanized aluminum and he's like you know looking around he's like i can't be the only one in here that's done galvanized aluminum it's because one of his first jobs was doing body work on uh i forget what car model vans or whatever and it's all just galvanized aluminum and, and the teacher goes, oh, that's interesting. He's like, what in the world were you on? You know, he, he, he told me these, these fans, you know, this this galvanized aluminum. And uh, so what kind of helmet were you using? He's like, what helmet? <laughs> He's like, well, you know, filters was like my nose, you know. <laughs> and the, he said the teacher's about flipped out, like, oh, my God, you can't do that. That stuff's toxic. It'll kill you. <laughs> no fume fever. Uh, I... It's like I'm not where I work, nobody had a helmet. Yeah. I was in a facility in Geneva, Illinois, and the facility manufactured and used um, steam heated hydraulic presses. And the molding operation would put in uncured resin with fiberglass in it and they had a specific pattern as to how they would load stuff so that it would flow and fill all the corners and stuff and i i had some problems with with that and with the operation in general they were using um isocyanate and resin and, and catalyst without providing any protection. And everybody in the entire department has been sensitized to the isocyanate. Uh, and, and that's this stuff is so potent in the amount of your absorbed through the cornea and your the lens of your eye is enough to permanently uh, make you. Uh, React. Yeah. People can't ride in a car. They can't have carpet in their house. They can't have phone anywhere. This place was also had a prototype operation where they would take an object, coat it with a mold release, and would spray on metalized zinc. Nice to make an operation. It's like. The guy's got a supply there, respirator on, and it's in a booth. And I'm in, the booth is in a room about the size of this, and he's over there. And he's saying, Give me a quarter, and I'll show you how this thing works. And so he brings it, and he's over there metalizing this quarter with this uh, vaporized thing, is what it's coming out of. And about 12 hours later, I'm in the airport uh, hotel, and it hit me. It's like, I was, I was in the back of the room, and I can't imagine how anybody that could have done that type of work uh, without just immense uh, respiratory protection and ventilation. Yeah. But, you know, I, I was aware of, of the hazards, and I, I thought I was being safe. Being safe. I thought I was well away from it. They had uh, 
I'm sorry to get off on some uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, areas where um, the hydrogen sulfide levels were high enough that it was a factor of fatigue. You couldn't tell whether the levels were high or not existing. Mm -hmm. they, and they had people that had been killed. But they didn't they go in. And you know, I'm just amazed. Were you working between Ross and Shandon at that point? Okay. Uh, there's a nuclear feed plant out there that did a bunch of stuff with hydrogen sulfide. Oh, no. Uh, For no. Yeah. yeah. No. no. Uh, a colleague of mine worked there, but I never did. Mm -hmm. It's uh it's six thirty. I don't see anybody gathering up, so we're going maybe we're we're, we're we're going push our luck a little. But if I if I hang up real fast, you'll know why. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. I used to live out there in Ross. We used to go yeah. out. Drive, drive out past Fernald all the time. It's kind of cool. <laughs> I lived in Shandon for a year and got a couple of checks from the closing of Fernald. And it was like 15 years after. I got a call and somebody said, is this recurrent address? And I'm like, who's this? <laughs> uh, and it was some attorney. And da -da 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 -da. I'm like, yeah, that's my address. Am I going to get served here or something? And a check showed up. And then, and it was a, I mean, considering that I lived there for just under a year when I was six, it was a pretty good check. It was $2,000. And then another one showed up about two years after that for another grant. Okay. I'm not going to, Complain. Apparently, apparently, uh, I don't know. You might, you might know. Apparently, our AK did that with uh, part of a little section of Middletown. They were paying, paying out some damages. And what are you talking about over there on the reservation? Yeah. Um, At that whole little section, I guess it, it's. Call that because all the street names are like set out on uh, Seneca and Ottawa and Apache. Oh. And, yeah, yeah, I know where um, This is public knowledge, so I'm not sharing any secrets. I had been at work in early January, and we had a, a guy coming in from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission out of Chicago, we had just a few things left to look at. And we didn't want to spend the night and come back for 20 minutes the next day. So we stayed over until about 6.30 working on his inspection. This the kind of made him. I mean, it was not a big deal. When I got home, and the phone rang, and it was the police department. And they said the fire department was down on Ottawa Street and they didn't want to come over the radio, but they'd like your assistance to come down and look because they're getting strange readings on your instrumentation. I didn't know where Ottawa Street was, so I looked up on the map. And it butted up against the Wilfoot battery. And the reason the fire department called me is I, I had worked with them to hazardous material they because they would respond to middle town works. So for Sarah 311 and 312, uh, I coordinated stuff with them. So I put my equipment back on and go by the office and pick up some test equipment and get down there. They say, we don't know what's going on here in this house, but we have to have 
to chop a hole in the roof and let the hydro come out. And they had an instrument and they didn't understand how it worked. If you knew what you were testing for, you could say, okay, I want to test for calorie and it would give you an accurate result. But it wouldn't tell you what it was testing. It would only respond like an uh, infrared. So if you said, okay, uh, toluene, or benzene, not xylene, carbon monoxide, and give you a reading on all, all of those, none of them were accurate unless you knew what it was you were looking for. So they had this instrument and they were getting all these weird readings. And so I went in and went down the steps to the basement and immediately recognized this house was filled with coke oven gas. Oh. Okay. Um, coke oven gas is a really nasty stuff. Yeah. It's 5% hydrogen. It has uh, 15,000 parts per million carbon monoxide, 1,500 is immediately dangerous to life. It's full of benzene, toluene, xylene. And the family that had been living there, it was a, a split household, and the father had brought the children home and said, I smell natural gas. So he contacted the CGE people and they came out and said, well, we don't have any natural gas. It's it's not not us. So they contacted the fire department. The fire department came over and they just didn't know what they had gotten into. The ground had frozen and it trapped coke of gas that was leaking from the main. It traveled under this frozen level through the ground until it found an opening. And that was their basement. And the foundation of the house was a hole in the ice. The other houses were slabs. The work was part of the apartment. So we've got to go to every house on this entire block and check whether they have a, a basement. And if they do, what the CO levels are. And they go down and they find another little couple down the street who got just off the scale levels of carbon monoxide. You know, you gotta get out. And the partner says, we don't have the authority to order somebody out of the house. I said, who does? And it's a health department out of Hamilton. Get on the phone. Condemn their houses. This is one. I don't have them deputize you. I'm not real happy about kicking these people out of their houses, but you can get in a few minutes or not. Yeah, I, uh, the alternative is, is unacceptable. I can't get a hold of my boss or anybody like that. So we're going to pay for your hotel, we're going to pay for your meals, we're going to pay for whatever you need, we will pay for it. So the woman with the kids the next day, the VP of community relations gives her a check for $7,000. You don't have to sign anymore. This is just to cover your expenses. And the other in Middletown, town, that's three months in. <laughs> well, that was on Thursday at noon. I get a call from her on Saturday and she said, I'm out of money. So it's like, you're going to have to contact Alan McCoy. He's the one who gave the change. I don't have another $7,000 to give you. The other, the only couple down the road, they called me on Monday and we need to get back into our house. I said, what things? My husband's out of <laughs> Go buy underwear. Yeah, they do. <laughs> buy as much as you need. And so those homes were purchased by AK and torn down. 
the people that live there, particularly the older couple, their nieces and nephews also lived in the neighborhood, and it was a support thing where they were taking care of their, support, you know, their relations and stuff. And so AK bought all of that property so that they could move into an area that was a, a much nicer area. Um, I heard they apparently cut checks to a bunch of people down there though. Oh, oh no question. I <laughs> once once we resolved what the issue was and the people were no longer at risk, my part was done. Yeah. There's a guy came to the door at my house a couple of years later, and he was from some environmental group. And said, "Yeah, I'm I'm protesting against AK for the treatment of the public." And so I I had seen this little flyer we had turned over and said, "See where it says call and apologize to me? That's me." <laughs> and so he packed up and left. He didn't he didn't press it any further. Um, to this day, I can't tell you how close we came to killing him. Oh, yeah. It, it was a, a section of Pocahontas line that was under pressure, but had been abandoned. And, and that we just see that mm. and, and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get a hold of anybody. So I'm, I'm feeling kind of naked and alone out there telling people, well, yeah, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. Um, and I figured, well, I'm doing the right thing. What the worst thing that happened is I can get fired yeah. from that. But the next day, the uh, the people I worked with at AK said, if you ever have a situation come up like this, again, anybody can do it. This is the right way to do it. And we protect people first. I I felt pretty proud about that. I I uh, I did not realize that you were that heavily involved in in that. So that's the that's that's a whole new part of the story that I didn't didn't know. So. Uh -huh. I, I knew a lot of what had gone on because I have friends that live down there and they kept telling me stuff. And I was yeah. like, oh, okay. <laughs> and um, from the standpoint of the stock, um, simply having that story come up on channel seven the next day was a three dollar share drop in the price of the stock. I don't know how many shares of stock are outstanding. And there is a hell of a lot of money. The, uh, the thing that I, to this day, was very proud of AK doing it. They took the entire responsibility and said, if you ever have this situation, this is what we do. We do the right thing. Well, beats what a lot of them do. Yeah. I'm kind of curious because I knew somebody that lived down there not that long ago. When did this happen? Oh, it's it's been twenty five years. Oh. Since I, they, I, they, I knew a woman that lived behind that, that's at NASCARs. There, there's a little drive through there, NASCARs and yeah, like grandpa's ice cream or something across the street. Yeah. I knew 
somebody that lived there 10 years ago. And, and there is a person who, um, I cannot speak further about that because I don't know that it's public knowledge. So I, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't address it. I just, there are people still living in those houses. Yeah. Um, it, I don't think it was the entire neighborhood, though. Okay. Was it? It, it just was yeah. a certain street. But a lot of people in the neighborhood, according to my friend who lived a few streets over, he, they, his family got a check. Yeah. With um, time, that neighborhood existed before the blast furnace was built in '54 and the coke plant was built. And so, uh, at that time, it was our and the plant passed Lefferson Road and out into that section. Uh, at the time, number three blast furnace was the largest blast furnace in the world, and the Wilfoot battery was constructed. And this is my opinion, my opinion only, of the people that lived in that neighborhood got treated like shit. It, they had a nice community in a nice neighborhood, and somebody plopped down a damn dirty ass, coal infested, filthy operation right in their backyard. That happened well before you know, I had anything to do with. Yeah, that, that's my opinion. I'm think I'm thinking that I'm thinking that he was talking about coal dust or something. It, and there's a uh, coke breeze was trucked in the big Euclid's on a road right. If the houses were on Auto Street, then you walk out the backyard. There's a fence. Uh -huh. and the other side of the fence is a, a road hauling coke breeze. You can't. It, it, it'd be like walking into a, a white linen oh, laundry yeah. with a bucket of dirt and just throw it up. Or not if, if you go down there, AK property line butts right up against the back of a couple of the property lines. Yeah, yeah. But I think I think AK owns that property. They probably do. It didn't change from. from what people work in. They just to live on Persian. Yeah. Which is across the street and down a block. And that was kind of neat. It was it was an interesting place. Yeah. Instead of up there, you know. I don't know when they built the power plant there, but that's what it does. It's stupid. There's one on the other end. I apologize to you for not being able to discuss this. I, 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 I may be perfectly free to, to do that, but I don't know that I am. Yeah. No, I, I just... I was just curious when that all happened. That's all. Um, but I, I can say that. Didn't know if AK had made some change where they were able to sell off that property or just. I, I can say that the, there was no toxics involved. This was all um, a cleanliness issue. Yeah. Which is just considerably different. You know, I, I interviewed with AK Steel. Um, I didn't get the position, unfortunately. I wish I had, but you know, I, I was pretty impressed with it. I, they gave me a tour of the place. Um, would have trying to remember who I interviewed with, but we ended up, went out for steak. And the interview went through lunch and everything. Um, I'm trying to remember why I didn't get the position. It was down to me or, or one other person, another person got it. But I was kind of looking forward to that. Was that with IT? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
they were so most of their IT was running off of an AS400 at the time. And they were looking to move to Linux or some other Unix to get off of that because they just couldn't support it. I wish I'd been able to do that. Oh, they had a strange situation came up with um, the IT people were not being responsive to the needs of the maintenance people. Mm -hmm. So maintenance people went out and bought their own computer nice. and hired their own people uh, to do the programming and stuff. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately, you end up with a whole lot of right. EB then. The, the guy that was in charge of that, um, Al Decatur, uh, sent over a little note to my boss and said, what do you think about this and this and this? Well, it was so good. Well, you know, we did that, but that's really not. Well, why did you talk to Al? Sorry. Yeah. I go over to him and I say, these are okay, but this is what you want to do. This is what you want to do about. Well, he hands me an info basic manual and a key to the room. So I could go over any time I wanted to and write my own applications. Nice. And when it eventually did get turned back over to the IT people, I had my own login. And I told them I have made a back door. So if you look at my menu options, X down here says back door pass security. <laughs> <laughs> so I can go in to the column level at the machine and not have any any security at all. If I wanted to completely format all of hard drives, <laughs> I, I could have, but it's like, I'm gonna be real careful what I'm doing here. Yeah. Um, the work that I did, um, um, we had to inventory every chemical on site. So we would know the room, the container type, the pressure, and the temperature of everything that we had in the facility. And that was beyond my abilities to write in InfoBasic. And the gentleman that they had hired as a program was really, really quite good. And when we started to do this, I sat down with him and some other people, and I had just a flow chart. Hold on. I, I just draw it up. Basically, it was pretty easy to first draw out. Wasn't a particularly detailed. He looks at this. Where do you get this flow chart? Because I, I need it. So I, I got to be friends with him. And uh, as we're working through this, he was very sensitive to people. So he, he would allow people to put in input however they like to do it. Pounds, gallons, ounces, cans, tons, barrels. Mm -hmm. And then we would switch it to what we needed to do to do the recording. So I discovered that one of his programs wasn't working quite right. And you remind me a lot of, of this guy in physical appearance. So I, I go in and he's got three terminals and he's working on one and then start that and compiling and then we work on another and start. So I ask him which is going to be here and he pulls up which of the 600 programs he's written. He's got it. 
this one is right here. And it goes to the white line number. It goes around to what's its color. Oh, I see what it is. This is it. Nice. Yeah. It was, it was very, very nice working with someone who was able to do that. That reminds me of a fellow I worked with in the Andy. Um, Andy taught me more about Unix than every place I've worked other than, than with him. At one point, uh, the company was being embezzled from at another location, and they had changed passwords on the server so that we couldn't get in to, to see what they were doing. And I'm talking with Andy, I'm like, okay, I know you have to put a back door in there. And he's like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. There was a file in the root directory called egg. The, the permissions were followed by file. It was readable and writable by any. It had 30 lines in it. And it was directions to where the documentation was on how to maintain the system. If you wrote in a blank line and then a command, it would run that command as root. When it when it was 32 lines, it would do that. If it was more than that, it trimmed it back to 30. If it was 31, it trimmed it to 30. If it was 32, and our last thing was a thing that could be run, it ran it. So we reset root password with that, um, logged into the system, woman was was scraping about eighty thousand dollars a year and we told the owner of the company who was here in cincinnati and this was up in shelby ohio which is north of, of columbus and sam collected nice cars he had a, a acura nsx which was very very quick and Sam and I drove up there to Shelby in like an hour and two minutes. It was scary. <laughs> but, yeah. So Sam talked, it was his account. And Sam talked to her and said, oh, I'm going to be up next week sometime. And we got in the car and, and he's calling the police while we're on our way up there. And they met us there. All of that because of egg. I, I had a neighbor who was an internal auditor with Armco. And she would go to South America. And she said she always kept her passport and a plane ticket home in a purse. And he was looking at the books that had been cooked. And she said, well, I'm going to go out for lunch. Um, I'm going to leave my coat and my stuff here. And is that OK? He said, sure. She went to the airport, got on the plane, she went home. Because she said, if I had alerted that I needed to go to the books, I wouldn't have ever left the company alive. Yeah. Ah. That's a, it's one of those things where we don't think about yeah. putting our lives at risk or exposing uh, problems. Yeah. But there's places that don't mm -hmm. work. Yeah. 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 Where are you going? Mm -hmm. um, one of the, you know, the people I worked for, whether it was Armco, whether it was AK, or it was, and even now, I believe in the clips. They want to do the right thing. And so I've never had a problem with them. This is what. And, and, Management. We really want to do this. 
know that we were to listen to people. Well, we want to do that. Uh, okay. If you think I'm wrong, you can go argue with me about it. So he, he's, he's not for yes people. Mm -hmm. He's wanting to solve the problem. And I assured him that if I thought he was wrong, I was going to argue with him. I didn't need the permission. Uh, you know, anyway, that's my experience with something. So, you know, if they are paying people off in uh, the resignation. Take care. It's it's, it's see it, you next week. We we made it we made it to seven. <laughs> yep. I, yeah, we did. It'll be virtual I'm next sorry. week. I thought I'm curious. Yeah. See you next week. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>